Inside every life and inside every home, there are two sets of records being kept, two different books of accounting. And how you go about your life has a lot to do with which set of records means more. The two sets of records of which I speak can be best illustrated by where in your house you might go when someone were to ask you to see your records. Show me, the person might say, show me where you keep your records. Now, the first place we might think to go when asked where we keep our records is perhaps to our den or home office or wherever we keep things like our checkbooks, our bank statements, our insurance policies, our mortgage documents, our brokerage account information. That's the first place we might think to go when someone asks us where do we keep our records. The other place we might think to turn when someone were to ask to see our records is to the shelf somewhere in our house where we keep our photo albums. In this day and age, of course, that would mean more likely our smartphones or our laptops. This is where we might turn to show our records because there is the record of our relationships, the record of the people whose lives we encountered and who have in some way shaped us. Show me where you keep your records. Show me where you keep your accounts. How you go about your life has a lot to do with which set of records means more. When I was young, we had a flood in the basement in our house where we stored a lot of our things. And I remember two things being destroyed. My parents passed tax returns and their wedding pictures. You can imagine which loss brought the greater heartache. How you go about your life has a lot to do with which set of records means more. It seems to be the issue that was brought before Jesus when someone in the crowd came to him and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So something was askew. Some accounts were not right. The Jewish law was pretty clear who was supposed to get what when it came to the family inheritance. But a close look at the records obviously indicated that the math wasn't right. Somebody was not getting what he thought he deserved. It's a tale as old as time. It is a wedge that breaks up the best of families. Who got what? Who deserved what? Whose records were correct? And the family gathers in the home office and pours through the bank statements and legal documents and brokerage accounts and punches in the numbers into the calculator to determine how this story is going to end. So Jesus tells the crowd a story about the man who kept pretty good records. The man who knew a good piece of land when he saw it, the man who knew how to plant the right crops at the right time, the man who knew how to get the best price per bushel, the man who knew how to read a, spree read a spreadsheet, a man who knew how to crunch numbers, a man who knew that cash was king. And so when it came time to respond to the challenge of a burgeoning inventory and not enough warehouse, made the move to tear down one set of barns and to build bigger ones. Pretty simple. You don't need an MBA to figure that one out except that he hadn't checked the actuarial tables to see that there was a 100% chance that at some point he was not going to be around to cash it in. He wasn't going to be around to do anything with what he had kept such good records over. Rich in things, Jesus said, but not rich toward God. The checkbook was fat. The photo album, slim. It's almost as if Jesus is saying that when it comes time for our actuarial number to be up, that there will come the question, can I see your records? And life at that point will have a lot to do with which set of records we have to show, the record of real earnings or the record of relationships, the list of inventory or the list of contacts, the checkbook or the photo album. 
Because what Jesus was seeing right in front of him were two brothers who were letting the checkbook get in the way of the photo album. Lord, for me, it's about the bottom line. It's about the ledger. It's about who's got what. And I'm willing to put at risk my relationship with my brother to make sure I've got what's coming to me. I need this book to add up more than I need that book to add up. It's all about the size of the barn for me, Jesus, and not who's in it. It's more about what I've accumulated and less about what I have spent. But you know, the greatest stories of life are stories of what was spent and not what was collected. I was up in New York last week and took a little time to visit the Morgan Library, the wonderful collection of ancient and rare books and manuscripts collected by the millionaire, back when a millionaire meant something, J.P. Morgan. Now, it's no secret that I love books, and I have far too many of them, and that point dawned on me even more when I found myself surrounded by these incredibly rare and rich volumes and and I was not allowed to touch them. They were books that I was not allowed to read, locked in cages, not to be touched by human hands, too valuable to be opened, which, when it comes to books, seems to defeat the purpose. So don't you wonder if what Jesus is trying to say is that life is more about the spending than about the collecting. What good is the checkbook if you haven't been able to produce many Kodak moments? It's almost like at the risk of abruptly changing metaphors. It's almost as if Jesus is saying that life is more about what painting you're creating than about how much paint you have on your palette. Think, if you will, about a French painter standing before his easel and holding his palette, which has bunches and bunches and bunches of colors, and he's so impressed by the colors that he's afforded and amassed, he'd like to get more colors, not just red, but shades of red, not just blue, but sapphire and azure, not just green, but teal and turquoise. And, and soon he's got a big, big palette, and he needs a bigger one. And so he gets more colors and more colors and more colors, and what's standing before him is an empty canvas. He's enamored with his paints that he hasn't thought to paint. But the point of the paints is the picture. The purpose of the palette is not how many paints you've got, but what you do with the paints you have. Mix, match, create the rainbow you need for the painting that you've been put here to paint. Four colors, five colors maybe. Lord knows what beautiful creations can come from just a pencil. It's not how much you've got. It's what you do with what you've got. Daryl Potter, a Canadian woman, tells via Bruce Larson of a day several years ago when she was working in her office and she banged her knee against the filing cabinet. That little bump on her knee ended up turning into something called thrombophlebitis, and from there her life began to spiral. Her illness led from one thing to another, and she was forced to endure scores of surgeries, which led to the amputation of three of her four limbs and the loss of sight in one eye. Over this awful pilgrimage, she became addicted to pain medication and through that lost her husband. What remained were her three children, one healthy limb, one healthy eye. So it may be hard to believe that Daryl is the author of a book entitled God's Wonderful Gift to Me. And in it she writes, it is not my missing limbs that matter now but what is within me that counts, I feel like a painting on an easel. God's gift to me is life, and what I do with this life will be my gift to God. 
God's gift to me is life, and what I do with this life will be my gift to God. It's not about how much you have on your palate, how big is your collection. It's about what you put on the canvas. It's about what you've spent. Because you know you can drive yourself crazy calculating what you've got compared to the other guy, how much inheritance for me, how much inheritance for you. And it's not about that. It's about the painting you've painted with the colors that you've been given. Some of you may remember hearing about Flo Wheatley, among many things. Flo Wheatley was a mom caring for a son who was battling cancer. She had to take care of a son battling cancer. No one, no mother wants to have to do that, but it was what life expected from her. You paint with the colors you've been given. So Flo's first painting was taking care of her little boy, and that meant weekly leaving Pennsylvania with her boy and taking a train to New York City to get treatments for his cancer. And one afternoon as they left the hospital, her son was very sick and vomiting and was weak and she could hardly get him down to the train station. And even then it started to rain and Flo didn't think she could put one more step in front of the other when all of a sudden behind her, she heard a voice say, you need help lady. And behind her was this homeless man wearing ragged jeans, sneakers, and a cut-off army jacket. She was afraid instinctively of the guy, so she declined his help. No, he said, you need help. And with that, he picked up her suitcase, walked with them down toward the train. They got to the train. He boarded the train with them. When they got to their stop, the man got off with them and hailed a cab for this mom and her sickly son. When the cab came, Flo didn't know what to do for this homeless man who had just given her so much. So she reached into her pocketbook, pulled out the first bill. She put her hands on a $5 bill and she gave it to him and got into the cab and off they sped. And as they did, she heard the man say, please lady, don't abandon me. Well, Flo couldn't stop remembering those words, don't abandon me. Well, during the next two years, her son responded to treatment. Her can his cancer went into remission, but Flo couldn't stop hearing those words, don't abandon me. So now living in Hot Bottom, Pennsylvania, Flo didn't have much anymore on her palate, nothing much left on her palate. She had spent it all on, on her sick little boy. She realized all these clothes that her children had that they were no longer wearing, and Flo got the idea to take these clothes, sweaters, jeans, coats, whatever, and make out of them a sleeping bag, which she did, and when she was done, her husband drove her into the city, and they found a man huddled in a doorway in the freezing New York winter, and they gave him this sleeping bag, and she went home, and she made eight more bags and delivered them into the city, Word got out into town what Flo was doing, and Flo spoke about it at her local church, and, and she called what she was making ugly quilts, and you take what you got, you take all the clothes you're never going to wear again, and you make them into a warm sleeping bag, and she called her ministry My Brother's Keeper Ugly Quilt Group. Women in town decided to help. They gathered and made it into a social group. In just a few years, over 5,000 sleeping bags got made. People from around the area, around the state, around the country began contacting Flo to find out how to make these sleeping bags. She started sending out instructions, first to a missionary in Mexico who asked how to make them for the people he served, and army unit in Europe asked how to make them. She learned later that Flo designed sleeping bags were being airdropped into Bosnian refugee camps, hotel chains, and were donating bedspreads and mattress pads. It was believed several years ago that over 100,000 sleeping bags have been made, all because Flo couldn't forget the homeless man who said, don't abandon me. But the great thing is, she's got this big photo album, this huge photo album. She's got this beautiful canvas with which she has spread these mixed and matched colors of all those materials. She's got these wonderful images emblazoned in her mind of all the warm people 
that she's collected in her little barn. I'm not sure who said it. I'm not sure who said that life can either make you bitter or it can make you better. Life can either make you bitter or it can make you better. But I suppose it has something to do with what records you're keeping, what accounts you're most concerned about, what's left on the pallet, and what is so brilliantly spread across the canvas.